Good day. In the last lecture, uh, we talked about various multiple access schemes and uh, one of this uh, set of schemes in token bus and DQ, DB, etcetera were uh, using tokens. Okay. Now, we will use the, uh, we will see two other variants of it namely token ring and uh, FDDI. So, we are going to talk about token based MAC and specifically, um, uh, so there are some kind of round robin MACs that means, uh, the um, chance to transmit comes to each of the station in a round robin fashion. Uh, this can be done as I mentioned earlier through polling or token passing. Here we will be specifically uh, talking about token passing. So, uh, the first uh, um, system that we will talk about is the token ring. All right. So, uh, as the name itself suggests that it is a ring topology that um, uh, it is a ring topology and a token ring MAC works with a special pattern or token which is 3 bytes long. So, 3 byte words of bits called token which moves from one computer to the next. Priority indicators are placed within the token. How the priority indicators are used? we will uh, see later. So, uh, so data rate may be 4, 16 or 100 Mbps, medium may be UTP, STP or fiber. Um, signaling may is usually differential Manchester and uh, we mentioned this earlier what is differential Manchester that how you represent your zeros and ones by electrical signals or optical signals as the case may be. And the maximum frame size uh, would be about uh, this 4550 bytes or right up to 18.2 kilobytes. So, a token ring like a token bus, a token is passed around the ring uh, at, and within the token is an indicator sensing whether the ring as free or busy. Okay. If uh, that uh, token is busy, that means some frame is being communicated at that time. The token circles continuously around the ring passing each station. Each station is required to examine the uh, token. So, if a station wishes to transmit data and the token is empty that means, the ring is free, it seizes or captures the ring by modifying the token to a uh, start of uh, user frame indicator, appending the data and control fields and sending the frame around the ring to the next station. So, the next station now will get the token as well as the frame which will pass on uh, till we get uh, to the um, node where the data is copied only if it is to be passed to the end user application attached to the node. That means, that uh, data is um, there is a destination address kind of thing. So, there is a destination. So, uh, when the, the destination node uh, uh, sees that uh, data it knows that this is for him. So, he sort of absorbs it that means, he copies it back, uh, he makes a copy of it and sends it to the application layer in, in that particular node uh, through all the other layers may be. So, we are not concerned about that at the moment, but, uh, but the token and that uh, frame uh, continues uh, circulating in the ring till it comes back to the sender. So, when the token arrives back at the original site, the token is once again made free and placed onto the network. So, you see in this scheme is uh, such that uh, only one frame, uh, I mean if the ring is busy at all, then one frame is traveling uh, along it. So, it has uh, left the source station, then it has been copied by the intermediate nodes onto the, uh, this, uh, the frame as well as the token with the uh, busy indicator over there and then it finally, comes to the end station and at the end station uh, that means, the destination station he makes a copy of the data for its own use and keeps on circulating this um, frame and the token right up to it when it comes back to the original sender. The original sender will now strip this all this data make the token free and put it on the ring. Now, somebody else whoever wants to transmit next he will capture the token and then send it in this fashion. So, it is a very simple kind of scheme. Um, and this is how this shared medium namely the ring is being shared by all these nodes attached to it. So, when station wants to transmit it has to wait for the token, then it has to seize it and then it transmits the frame. 
when station ceases token and begins transmission there is no token on the ring so nobody else can transmit so since nobody so there is no um, uh, contention or collision as such because only the station which has got the token he can transmit so all others do not transmit what is the expected performance of token passing first of all it is fair because it is going in a round robin fashion so uh, it is uh, it uh, i mean everybody will have his chance each computer is given in turn an opportunity to transmit even when the traffic is high however even if only one uh, computer needs to transmit a message it has to wait uh, till the time that it receives back the token so until it receives the token it cannot start transmission so it has to wait again long messages should not be allowed because otherwise one computer may hold the token for too long several uh, tokens uh, now there are uh, there is a some variation of it using slotted rings where several tokens or slots uh, are used these are these may be more useful to make it more efficient because only one if it is a very long ring and only one uh, frame is traveling down it so that is uh, uh, rather inefficient way of uh, using the system uh, so what we do can do is that we might allow multiple uh, frames uh, that means multiple in multiple slots so which are sort of distributed over the space so, for example, if the speed is 200 meters per microsecond um, of the frame, the data rate is at the rate of 10 Mbps. So, at 10 Mbps, 10 bits per microsecond. So, these 10 bits will span over 200 meters over the ring. So, 2 kilometer ring can hold 100 bits. That is the kind of uh, performance with a single <coughs> frame. Now, uh, let us look at how the priority works in the token ring, because uh, what we can do is that we can give differential pri priorities to the nodes in the uh, network and this is how it works. So, let us go through one example. Assume a token ring has 5 stations attached to a priority ring. Station A has priority uh, access of 1, 1 is uh, let us assume is the lowest priority. Station B and D have priority of 2 and station C and E have priorities of 3. So, C and E have the highest priorities. Once again assume that A had already seized the ring and is transmitting data frames. The token has a bit set to indicate that the token is busy. So, the token is busy and uh, that means because A has already put a frame in it and uh, so it is being sent from A. Station B receives the frame it has data to transmit also. So, let us uh, uh, say that all of them wants to transmit some data. So, station B receives the frame it has data to transmit, but it cannot transmit at the moment because the ring is busy, so, but it plays, uh, places its priority of 2 in a reservation field within the token. So, it puts 2 over there uh, in that uh, reservation field and sends the token and the frame sent by A along uh, to C, it then passes the token to C. Station C also determines that the ring is busy, it has data to send. So, it places 3 uh, now. So, this 3 in the reservation field thus displacing the 2 which was inserted by B. So, uh, uh, 2 gets replaced by 3 in the reservation field, other things remain as it is, it is still the A's frame which is moving along. Station C then passes the frame to D, uh, um, D must defer because if you remember uh, that we had uh, the priority of 1 to A, uh, 2 to B and D and 3 to C and E. Uh, so, it came from A to B, B put a reservation of 2 of reservation and its priority of 2, then C overrode this with its priority of 3. Now, D sees that there is a priority 3 um, uh, who is waiting, so and D only has a priority of 2, so it has to defer, so it cannot do anything. All right. So, D must defer, it cannot place its priority of 2 into the field because a priority of 3 is already there. Consequently, it passes the frame to E, which examines the reservation field. Upon seeing the 3 in the field, it does nothing because uh, since its priority is also 3. So, E also has a priority of 3, so E cannot do anything. So, E simply sends it along. Station A receives the frame back. 
it then makes the ring free by resetting the token and passing the token to B. B is not allowed to use the token because the reservation field inside the token is equal to 3, one higher than the priority of B. Okay. So, uh, B cannot, uh, although B wants to transmit and the ring is free, even then uh, B cannot uh, really start transmitting because somebody with a priority 3 is uh, waiting. Okay. C is allowed to seize the token because uh, the priority field in the token says 3 and C has a priority of 3. So, this is uh, which means that C is the first node with that level of priority to have uh, who which has uh, got the um, got the token. So, this uh, sort of uh, seizes the token, it places the data on the ring and sends the transmission to D. Now, uh, D is now allowed to place its priority of 2, although C is sending, but C has already put his frame and D sees that the, the, the now naturally the reservation field is reset. Now, D uh, can uh, place its priority of 2 into the reservation field, it does so and passes the frame to E. E of course, also wants to send. So, E displaces D's priority of 2 with its priority of 3 and passes the frame to A. A must A also wants to send again, but A must defer any reservation placement since its priority is 1. B must also forego any priority allocation since its priority is 2. C receives its transmission back, it is required to make the ring free, it does so and transmits the token to D. D is not allowed to seize the ring since its priority of 2 is less than the reserve priority which has been put there by C, reserve priority indicator of 3. So, it passes the token to E. E seizes the ring because its priority of 3 equal to or greater than the reservation of 3. So, this is the way the priority ring works. If you see that um, whoever put the um, uh, reservation earlier somehow I mean it uh, at the same level, so it comes back to him, so he puts the uh, frame over there. So, but if the higher priority nodes have finished uh, reservation transmission etcetera, then the lower priority nodes can start transmitting and so on. So, you can set these priority levels in, in the token. So, this is how not only you can have a pure simple round robin where everybody has the same priority or you can have uh, priority based uh, token ring also. Okay. There is a variation uh, of this uh, dedicated token ring. Um, <coughs> which is called dedicated token ring, where there is a central hub. So, there, here this is a more centralized system which acts like a switch and it is uh, more like a full duplex point to point link and a concentrator acts as frame level repeater and no token passing. So, we will pass this. Next, we will uh, take up another system, uh, this system is called FDDI. Uh, this is uh, still in use in uh, some places where some specific uh, um, applications, but then again FDDI is also uh, sort of uh, going out because uh, other newer technology is uh, taking its place. Okay. FDDI was originally uh, um, conceived as a high speed uh, network and this network could be uh, I mean FDDI could be used in a LAN and it is used in a LAN. It is also used in the WAN or in the backbone as high speed uh, data because when it was uh, conceived at that time 100 megabits per second was considered to be very high speed. Of course, things uh, technology have changed, but still it is instructive to look at uh, these technologies first of all to see that how different MAC schemes can work and new MAC schemes for new technology etcetera they are also coming up uh, <coughs> all the time. So, we will just uh, as an instructive uh, thing we will look into FTDI in some detail. So, FDDI was conceived as a high speed backbone technology. It is a dual ring topology just like your uh, may, maybe your if you remember your sonnet rings and we talked about uh, dual ring uh, topologies when we uh, in optical networks. By the way this is based on fiber. So, this is fiber distributed data interface that is the uh, acronym FDDI is for fiber distributed data interface. So, it uses dual ring topology using fiber optic cable used to transmit light pulses. 
optical fiber channel operates at a rate of 100 Mbps. Well, we can say 100 Mbps only at today, uh, but then at one point of time when it was uh, mm, sort of the standard was proposed in early 80s, it was supposed to be very high speed. Frequently used in LANs to uh, connect buildings together. So, ring circumference can extend to 200 kilometers, uh, distance between nodes can be up to 200 uh, kilometers. Okay. Uh, so, FDDI network can host up to 1000 nodes on one optical fiber that is how it was conceived. Of course, this optical fiber is not just one continuous optical fiber, this optical fiber goes from uh, by hop by hop that means from node to the node, what kind of nodes etcetera that we will see. So, this is uh, just an FDDI topology just like we have two rings. Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry a is known as the primary ring primary ring um, so which is shown in blue uh, sorry the, which is shown in uh, black the primary ring is the one which usually carries all the data and then there is a secondary ring which is used uh, for um, fault tolerance purpose okay as a matter of fact this is uh, one of uh, one reason why FDDI was used and is still used in uh, some places where the um, uh, reliability of the network is of a very high concern and we want to uh, get the uh, I mean uh, the network we cannot allow it to uh, remain down for any length of time. So, FDDI can quickly switch from the primary to the secondary ring. Uh, so, there is a, a protection kind of system as you can see because there is one ring which is wholly dedicated as a uh, secondary ring which is there. So, in case of a fault either of a link or in a particular node we can uh, quickly have another ring in its place. So, we the FDDI standard specification we, which as I said came up in 80s. So, this has uh, various parts one is the media access control part MAC. So, how medium is accessed, the frame format, token handling, addressing and error recovery. All right. uh, actually, uh, FDDI has a somewhat more complex uh, MAC uh, protocol because FDDI allows both um, synchronous as well as asynchronous traffic. All right. Now, if uh, some traffic is synchronous, that means if it is carrying some kind of uh, let us say voice or something, then you know that this 125 microsecond uh, length is uh, very uh, sacred and sacrosanct over there. So, every 125 microsecond some channel may have to uh, send something all right. So, that is there uh, as well as we can have uh, packets uh, or um, uh, packets or data uh, flowing in the network may be with uh, some kind of a lower priority. So, this can handle a mixture of both synchronous and asynchronous traffic that is a uh, uh, peculiarity of FDDI system which makes its MAC uh, somewhat more complex than a uh, plain vanilla token ring. So, we will see this uh, a bit of details of this MAC uh, later on. The physical layer protocol defines the data encoding and decoding, how data is encoded and decoded, we will see this later, clocking requirements and framing. The physical layer medium, characteristics of transmission medium, fiber optic link, power levels, bit error rates, optical components, connectors, etcetera. So, that is also a part of the standard um, for the physical layer medium. And there is some standard says something about the station management, define station and ring configurations, initialization, scheduling, collection of statistics, fault isolation and recovery from faults. Okay. As I said that recovery from faults is uh, I mean was and still is a very strong point of FDDI. Uh, I mean one reason why for some application FDDI may be preferred. So, as mentioned earlier topology of FDDI network consists of two independent rings. Primary ring A is used for data transmission while secondary ring B provides an alternate data path. This has already been shown and secondary ring remains idle unless primary ring fails. 
So, optical fiber rings are counter rotating that means uh, one is moving in one direction while the other is moving in one and the other direction. So, two signal paths are provided one in each direction. Why do we make the rings counter uh, rotating? Uh, well, we had seen this in our uh, uh, recovery um, lecture also. Uh, the reason is that if there is a node failure, what you can do is that suppose there are two, uh, suppose you are a station all right, and there are two counter rotating rings uh, passing through you. That means, one in one the signal will pass in this direction, in the other the signal will pass in this direction all right. Uh, well, and of course, in optical fiber uh, this is um, quite fixed because uh, you want to have proper transmitter on one side and a receiver on the other side. So, one ring is moving like this, the other ring is moving like this. Now, what might happen is that suppose the next station has failed and this station uh, understands that there is something wrong either with the link or in the uh, with the next uh, station. So, what I it might do is that it might make a quick connection over here. So, that the ring uh, coming in this direction may take out this other path and still we can make one ring now. Now, this ring will not have any um, fault tolerance there will be one ring uh, by using uh, a part of the uh, two rings A and B. So, we, we can uh, uh, get a recovery through that. So, that is why we have two counter rotating rings with two signal paths provided one in each direction. A station may be a computer workstation or node connected to FDDI network. So, there are some network nodes also we will talk about this or a station must be connected to both in order to use the secondary ring as an alternate data path. If it is connected to only one of them then it cannot use the alternate path. So, uh, media is as I said 1300 nanometer optical fibers transmission method is base band that means there is no modulation uh, only the pulses in the raw form are uh, traveling down the ring. Data rate is 100 Mbps and topology is a physical ring of trees uh, and a logical ring. Uh, why ring of trees where did trees come from we will uh, talk about it. Now, let us talk about the type of network stations which may be uh, connected to an FDDI ring. One is a dual attached station which is connected to both the rings that means, it is a station which is connected to both the rings that is why it is called dual attached. Then we have dual attached concentrator DAC which is connected to both rings and provides connection for additional stations and concentrators. It is actually the root of a tree. This is where the uh, tree comes from. I have a uh, picture. So, we have uh, this. So, this is the picture of an FDDI concentrator. So, you can see that this is the concern, this is the main part of the concentrator and the two rings are there the counter rotating. This is the primary ring and this is the secondary ring. So, the primary ring is coming like this from A to B and the secondary ring is going like this. It has some additional ports from which other stations may hang and actually what uh, might happen is that we may have a tree hanging from a concentrator. Okay. So, we have a tree of nodes here. So, that is why this main FDDI ring may be a ring of trees. Okay. The way FDDI is actually deployed and uh, this is also uh, interesting in the sense is that uh, you may have a very large, uh, uh, large ring that is possible. Sometimes what is done is that we make a very small ring in the uh, core of the system okay. like wherever your uh, main server and other things is uh, we make a very small ring uh, just within the um, uh, within the um, within a room all right. And what happens is that we have concentrators connected to this ring and from this concentrator a tree spans out uh, to all the other may be nearby buildings or whatever. So, that all of them are connected to this uh, FDDI uh, backbone, but the backbone is uh, has got two rings. So, this backbone is fault tolerant. So, that is a uh, good thing about FDDI. So, that is one way FDDI may be deployed. So, we have a very small ring and trees spanning out and going out of the building may be to other buildings and so on. All right. Or alternatively of course, you can have a large ring also. So, we have this dual attestations and dual attest uh, concentrators 
so concentrators could be the roots of trees and then of course we have i mean of course uh, dual attach stations and uh, dual attach concentrators are more costly we have a cheaper variety if you think that is good enough which is a single attached station which is attached only to the primary ring similarly you have single attached concentrators which is connected only to the primary ring through a tree a double attached station or concentrator can reconfigure the dual ring as mentioned earlier into a single ring in the event of a failure what are the physical interfaces like as opposed to a basic token ring network in which at any instant there is a single active ring monitor which supplies the master clock for the ring in fddi this approach is not suitable because of high data rates that is one thing and the other thing is that uh, the ring could be uh, very large so if the ring is quite large uh, then uh, you have um, uh, then uh, having the central um, uh, clock uh, becomes difficult uh, so every di approach so each concentrator would have a, on each this thing each ring interface has its own local clock and the outgoing data is transmitted using this clock all data to be transmitted is encoded uh, as i mentioned earlier how it is encoded prior to transmission using a four or five group code uh, so which means that there are really 32 possibilities um, uh, so, for 4 bits of data uh, we have uh, actually 5 bits which are going over there. So, the additional capacity is used in some other way for control purpose that we will see later. This means that for each 4 bits of data a corresponding 5 bit code word or symbol is generated by the encoder. Some of these symbols or combinations are used for link control functions. Now, let us go through the ring operation which is uh, well, uh, there are two aspects to it. One aspect is similar to the token ring which we have already discussed. So, uh, sending station waits for the token, sending station captures and strips token and then transmits frames, sending station issues token at the end of transmission. Now, this is uh, one point where this FDDI is different from a token ring. In a token ring if you remember that only when the um, transmitted frame uh, with that busy ring etcetera comes all the way back to the sender that is when the sender makes this token free and puts it back on the ring. Okay. Since uh, FDDI was uh, perceived as a high speed ring, so what uh, was proposed was that as soon as its uh, transmission of its frame is over, it can put a new uh, token on the, um, on the ring. So, multiple frames may be circulating in the um, um, ring at the same time, okay, bringing up the speed. So, sending station issues token at the end of transmission destination station copies the transmitted frame and sets the a and c which is the address recognized and frame copied indicators that means it has already copied the frame just uh, i mean somewhat like what we have in token ring sending station removes the data from the ring by stripping the sent and acknowledged frame etc <coughs> so it takes out the frame the first few bytes of the frame are not stripped this is for some technical reason and uh, we need not go into the details here and continue to circulate on the ring as a fragment. Each repeating station uh, strips one byte from the fragment and a transmitting station uh, completely strips it. So, there are some fragments also apart from the fr frame some fragments are also moving around in the ring. Now, we come to token passing scheme uses token passing protocol to move data around the ring uses another protocol based on timers. Okay. So, we will look at this uh, protocol later on. Timing is very critical to token passing scheme as it is designed for delay sensitive synchronous data. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, the um, FDDI ring uh, carries a mixture of data. Okay. It may carry lower priority um, packet uh, data kind of thing which is uh, which we have been talking about let us say in token ring. It may also ca carry uh, synchronous data okay, which is time sensitive. So, which has a somewhat higher priority than this uh, other one and this is based on some 
timing protocol and we will go into the timing protocol now. So, FDDI allows for high data rates where each ring interface has its own clock. All outgoing data is transmitted using this clock. A node will get packets within a specified amount of time. Uh, so, this is now we are discussing the uh, timing part of it. Um, so, a node will get packets within a specified amount of time. As a par packet circles the ring with a token behind, each station uh, retimes and regenerates the packet. Uh, so, this increases probability frame fragments will be propagated on the ring, we need not uh, bother about this. Uh, so, how fragments are eliminated. Um, early token release is required because of the high speed and extensive distance provide by, uh, provided by FDDI. So, I mentioned this. FDDI rotation time, FDDI uses time to ensure equal access to the ring measures rotation time by calculating distance of segments, processing time and the number of stations. So, this is the time you expect um, um, a packet to move around the entire ring. Rotation time refers to how long it takes for a signal to propagate around the ring. So, rotation time is used to control the priority operation of FDDI ring. We have uh, several times, one is measured by a clock that times the period between the receipt of tokens called the token rotation time. That means, how long is it uh, that the token takes to come around the ring. And the operation of MAC layer is governed by a MAC receiver and is calculated by target token rotation timer. That means, there is a, a target token rotation timer that means, target token rotation time which is uh, uh, prefixed and there is a TRT which is measured. Okay. So, this uh, from uh, so TTRT of course, uh, usually you would expect that under normal condition when the load is uh, moderate, the token rotation time would be less than the TTRT. So, that is the when the um, node is um, moderately loaded by comparing TRT with TTRT, we can find out how loaded the um, system is and depending on how loaded it is. Uh, we would uh, we would of course, if we have a synchronous link going through the synchronous traffic going through this FDDI ring, then the synchronous traffic will have to be given the first priority and uh, the asynchronous uh, traffic that is some uh, low, maybe some lower priority data traffic, they will be put on the ring or will not be put on the ring depending on how loaded it is. This is how it is uh, calculated. There is a pre-negotiated target time called PTT. PTT is coordinated for the arrival of a transmission. Each node measures time it takes for the token to return to it that is the TRT we have talked, talked about. It compares time to a pre-negotiated target time PTT for its arrival. A node is allowed to transmit as long as its full transmission stream does not exceed the PTT. Okay. So, uh, so there is a pre-negotiated target time uh, which is allowed and the node is allowed to transmit as long as its full transmission stream does not exceed the PTT. If the token comes back sooner than PTT threshold, it is deemed as a light network load. If the token comes back later than PTT, it indicates a heavy traffic load. Low priority traffic must then be deferred until load on the network becomes lighter. There is a token holding time THT. Uh, so, actually THT is equal to if you look at the last point, THT is actually equal to TTRT minus TRT. So, what is it? It is used to calculate maximum length of time a station can hold the token to initiate asynchronous transmission. The point is that there is a target time and there is an actual measured time by which the token has come back. If the actual measured time is low, that means the uh, network is lightly loaded. So, you can put some asynchronous traffic on that. So, that is why this THT is calculated. So, it calculates the difference between the arrival of the token and the TTRT. It keeps track of the amount of time a host can transmit. So, formula is this and then you have the following rules. If THT is less than 0, that means traffic is heavy, uh, the total rotation time is uh, actually now 
uh, more than the uh, expected time which was um, uh, sort of uh, fixed uh, or um, uh, expected earlier which means that all asynchronous traffic has to wait the synchronous traffic will go through. So, the THT is less than 0 uh, which is a heavily loaded uh, station stations can only transmit the synchronous traffic. If THT is greater than 0 stations can transmit both synchronous and asynchronous traffic during THT. So, it first sends the synchronous traffic and then sends the asynchronous uh, traffic till THT falls to 0. If THT is equal to 0 host cannot start any new packet. THT increases and number of stations uh, uh, decreases. Now, a uh, quick look at the FDDI frame format. We have a, um, so uh, I mean as a matter of fact any kind of framing as we will see, uh, I mean um, as I said that FDDI is a technology which is not moving uh, forward very much these days. So, uh, and as a matter of fact it may be uh, slowly on its way out because we have other ways of achieving the main point of FDDI uh, which is its fault tolerance. We have other ways of achieving that apart from the apart from fault tolerance of course, um, the speed of FDDI uh, has become I mean 100 Mbps is uh, rather uh, I mean considered not very fast uh, the, I mean so far as backbone is concerned it is con taken as a very low speed these days. So, FDDI may be on its way out and naturally it uh, is also expensive and uh, uh, the support to it is also dwindling. So, <coughs> the reason we are um, sort of looking at this at this how different MAC protocols uh, I mean how different issues are handled by a typical uh, MAC protocol. But anyway uh, this business about framing is common to all kinds of data link protocol. Uh, so, we will uh, later on when we talk about ethernet which is the most common kind of uh, network um, in the world today. Uh, so, we will see that it has its own frame format and uh, um, if you remember our first uh, days discussion when we were talking about these different layers uh, that um, um, just to remind you that these different layers they have uh, at the same level. Uh, that means, a network layer to network layer, network layer in this node to another network layer in this node. Similarly, the uh, transmission layer in this node to the transmission layer in that node or the um, etcetera, they have some protocol running all right. And how do this uh, protocol run? These protocols run by adding some header and in some cases a trailer also to the main payload. So, whatever it gets from the upper layer is the payload uh, to it for running its own protocol it adds some header that means, add some information to the beginning of the um, frame and add some information to the end of the frame to make a complete frame. And the corresponding layer in the other node in the other node strips this uh, particular information uh, does whatever it has to do uh, because it also is running the same protocol. So, it knows what to do and then maybe um, either it goes up or it goes down again to the next uh, station and so on. So, this is an uh, so this is an example frame format of FDDI, FDDI frame format this has some preamble. Uh, we will not go into the details of this because this is not very important anymore, but we will just mention that such fields are quite common in many frames. We have a start delimiter, we have a frame control, we have a destination address this has to be there because otherwise the destination the station will not know that this particular packet is meant for him. We have a source address field. So, we have a DA then an SA field. We have the data frame check sequence uh, for some error control. Uh, by the way error is not handled by FDDI error is uh, I mean it allows other layers to uh, handle the error if there is an error, but you have to check the error. So, frame check sequence end delimiter and frame status. And then we talked about uh, the encoding uh, process in FDDI. FDDI encodes all data prior to transmission uses a 4 or 5 group code method which was mentioned earlier. Encoder generates a corresponding 5 bit word or symbol for every 4 bits transmitted FDDI creates a 5 bit code. Bits provide clocking for the signal itself the status of bit reflects a change of state of the light on the other side. So, uh, this is what the symbols are like um, uh, 
taken with another symbol they form one byte. Uh, so, uh, there are 16 data symbols uh, you see with 5 bits we can have 32 different symbols out of which 16 data uh, uh, symbols are reserved for data this is for 0 to f. So, if you write your uh, stream of bytes in hex that means, 4 in groups of 4 bit each. So, each of these 4 bits is uh, has got its corresponding code in the FDDI symbol. So, from 0 to f and then we have 16 other um, um, uh, symbols which are left. So, 8 are used for control as control symbols and 8 as violation symbols. The control symbols are called q, h, i, j, k etcetera is not important. Coding the symbols prevents occ uh, occurrence of 4 consecutive zeros in a row. This is necessary to ensure each station's clock is in sync with the other station. So, these uh, the transitions that take place <coughs> when you have uh, when you go from a 0 to a 1 uh, and that transition uh, edge is used for synchronizing the clocks this is a very common method of synchronization. So, that is why uh, we uh, have got the codes in such a manner so that we do not have a long string of zeros because then the synchronization uh, I mean uh, may drift. Token field uh, the token has the following fields. Uh, so, we have a, a preamble, uh, we have a, a start delimiter, we have a frame control and we have an ending delimiter. So, to, uh, token is a, a, a simple kind of token like this. As I said one of the main points uh, of uh, FDDI is the fault tolerance uh, that it provides. Uh, so, uh, there is a ring wrap. Uh, I mentioned this earlier that in, in a concentrator in a dual letters concentrator if one of if it senses that on the other side the node has failed it can make a connection between the primary and the secondary uh, ring within itself. So, that the ring while coming like this sort of starts traveling like this and completes it uh, the, because if you have a node uh, on the other side also the corresponding concentrator will also see. So, he will also make a connection between the um, um, between the primary and the secondary ring. So, the failed node is essentially isolated on both the sides the uh, there are connections within the concentrator and instead of a uh, single ring uh, you have uh, instead of two rings now the two primary and secondary rings have fused together and then uh, suppose this was the uh, primary ring coming then it goes back and then the secondary ring through the secondary ring to the other concentrator on the other side and the uh, connection is completed. So, you have uh, one ring. So, that is why the physical diameter of an FDDI ring is uh, kept within 100 miles. So, that if there is a failure uh, the ring diameter uh, total ring diameter does not exceed 200 miles which is the standard. So, ring wrap techniques is the same technique as we mentioned earlier when we talked about protection and restoration technique is used to manage failures. When a station fails or a cable is damaged dual ring is automatically wrapped. Two adjacent ports connecting to broken link will be removed from ring and both stations either uh, enter wrap state. FDDI concentrator switches to wrap state and ring is doubled back onto itself data continues to be transmitted on FDDI single ring. Performance is not negatively impacted during wrap state. So, this is the good thing about FDDI. So, when you have uh, very mission critical uh, situations, um, so that is where FDDI when kept its strength for quite some time and that in very critical situations like maybe say uh, stock exchange or maybe something where even uh, a few seconds um, network down is not acceptable to anybody. Uh, so, there you can and uh, you could deploy this kind of technology where with its uh, very inherent uh, fault tolerance. So, this is the another picture of the FDDI ring wrap uh, as is shown over here that you have um, one station 4 which has gone down. Um, so, that uh, two uh, adjacent stations namely 2 and 3 uh, they wrap around and we have a single ring now going round. Okay. So, this is clear. 
and how is it done? This also we have uh, discussed earlier uh, that means we have optical bypass uh, switches uh, used um, for two or more failures to occur. Rings are segments back into two independent. By the way, what would happen if more failures occur? Okay. Suppose there was a one single failure, one single node failure and the uh, two rings primary and secondary then the two adjacent concentrators they wrapped back and we had a single ring like this, we had a single ring like this alright. Now what happens if another uh, um, node fails in between? So, what would happen is its adjacent concentrators would once again wrap around, but now instead of only one ring, one single ring which we had earlier in case of uh, single failure, now with this double failure we may have two rings. Okay. Now, these two rings are not connected to each other, so uh, this, uh, these two rings individually would still keep working all right, because there is a part of the protocol which I have not covered is that um, if uh, what happens if there is a single token which was on the other side now the token is lost, there is no token. So, there is a protocol for reclaiming a token, reclaiming and uh, generating a token there, there is a protocol for doing that. So, they will do that and now what would happen is that two individual uh, rings will come into operation uh, on the two sides, they will not be able to. So, the nodes which are connected to this sub ring uh, and the nodes which are connected to the other sub ring, they will not be able to communicate with each other uh, across, uh, across, but within themselves they will. Uh, very well communicate as usual all right so rings are segmented back into two independent rings incapable of communicating with each other additional failures can con can cause further ring segmentation so optical bypass switches can eliminate failed stations uh, from ring to prevent ring segmentation so how is it done well how is it done uh, we have all seen uh, actually this is all done with mirrors uh, so, optical bypass switch has optional optical mirrors that pass light from ring directly to a dash station during normal operation. Dash station experiences a power loss, optical bypass switch will pass the light through itself. So, uses an internal mirror to maintain ring integrity. So, that is done. And the other uh, technique of uh, this protection, etcetera, which we had seen earlier, namely dual homing, all right. This dual homing is also uh, used um, uh, could be used uh, in an FDDI context. A router or a DAS, DAS you remember is a dual attached station is connected to two concentrator ports on FDDI concentrator. One port could provide a connection to uh, active fiber link while the other port is in hot uh, standby mode. Actually there are uh, two nodes A and B usually the A node is in hot standby mode and the B node is operating. Uh, so, port is in hot standby or passive mode, hot standby is constantly tested and will take over if primary link fails. So, typical DAS configuration has a B port is designated as active port and the A port is configured as the hot standby. When the primary link fails, passive link automatically activates and hot standby becomes operational. So, it is the same dual homing principle which we had seen earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, for fault protection uh, for, um, failure and uh, uh, recovery okay recovery and protection okay with this we come to the uh, end of our discussion about with about token bus uh, uh, token ring and fddi so we have discussed a uh, number of these uh, token based protocols namely uh, token bus dqdb uh, token ring and FDDI. These are um, hmm, actually what has happened was this FDDI was uh, this way was quite good, only thing was that FDDI was also quite costly, okay. uh, um, maybe not uh, so. Uh, these technologies are actually uh, going out in some sense. Okay. Uh, one of the technologies which is sort of derived from here if, if you remember when we were talking about DQDB, we were talking, so it uh, handled 53 byte cells, so that sort of came down to ATM and ATM is a technology which is still quite alive today, so we will have an extensive discussion about uh, um, ATM. Regarding the uh, WAN technology, uh, two other technologies which are once again on their way out, uh, they are 
x 25 and uh, frame relay. Uh, uh, well, frame relay is still there in many uh, parts x 25 is sort of going out, but still we will just have a quick uh, look at these. And then when we have uh, considered these uh, MAC level, so this is how the next set of lectures will go. So, what will happen is that one uh, when we finish this, then we will talk about the we are talking about remember now we are talking about the data link layer and specifically about the MAC sub layer of the data link layer. Then we will talk have to talk about the LLC that is the logical link control. Uh, so, we will discuss that and uh, the other um, important. Uh, functionality of this data link layer which is the error and flow control. So, how error uh, if there is an error because whenever you have a transmission somehow you have to assume um, that errors may occur ok. Okay. Depending on the medium and the technology errors may be more or less frequent for example, in a fiber and uh, the error may be very low error probability may be very low when you are using wireless the error probability is high, but anyway you have to consider the possibility of some error. So, how errors are handled uh, that means, we are talking about now bit errors which may come in due to noise and other things into the data uh, in a particular link uh, that is one thing. And if there is a flow control to be done that means, uh, whether if there is a congestion or not because you are sending from one side whether the other send side is receiving it or not that you have to somehow have to make out. Uh, so, these things then we will take up next. Thank you. Good day. So, today uh, we will start uh, our discussion on data link layer. As a matter of fact, uh, we have already discussed a part of the data link layer namely the MAC sub layer and we will see how uh, that all fits in. But to fit it into the broader picture, if you remember when we were discussing the 7 layer OSI protocol uh, starting from the application layer, the bottom most layer was the physical layer. So, we have finished our discussion on physical layer and just above the physical layer we have the data link layer. So, we, we will look at the different components of data link layer and how they are used and we will look at a few protocols etcetera. So, that is what we will do. <coughs> so, our main this thing is data link protocols which are the protocols which are used in the data link layer. Now, what are the main tasks of data link layer? It transfers data from the network layer of one machine to the network layer of another machine. So, uh, uh, the actually this is the part of the service it gives to the upper layer. You remember that above the data link layer we have the network layer all right. Uh, so, uh, below the network layer we have the data link layer. So, the data link layer gives some service to the network layer and this service is the transfer of data uh, from one network layer to another network layer. So, that is the service it gives to the network layer and this in its turn uses the physical layer. So, it converts raw bit stream of the physical layer into groups of bits etcetera or frames. So, uh, this is how we can look at it. Uh, so, this is one node and this is another node. Um, above this of course, there may be other layers. <coughs> we are not concerned about these upper layers at the moment. So, this gets uh, some data to be sent from the network layer and this data link layer sends it to the next data link layer. Remember once again that the network layer is concerned with uh, transfer of data etcetera across the network that means, it may take several such hops, but data link layer is just concerned with a single hop. So, this is how we simplify the problem, the problem of going multi hop. Um, uh, so, this multi hop part we leave it to the network layer for this single hop. Uh, so, multi hop naturally will constitute a number of such single hops and data link layer uh, would uh, handle the transfer of data from one uh, uh, from one node to the next. So, what are the kinds of services type of services that the uh, data link layer gives? One is unacknowledged connectionless. Uh, so, uh, no attempt to recover lost frames. If some frame is lost due to noise error etcetera etcetera there is no attempt to recover this because and there is no acknowledgement from the other side it is a connectionless system. 
suited for low error rate networks or for fault tolerant applications such as voice. Uh, what we mean the, that the voice is a fault tolerant application? We mean uh, that even if some of the bits in a voice stream, digitized voice stream that is, even if some of the bits uh, drop, uh, obviously there will be some degradation on the other side if you are do, do not do, are not doing any kind of correction etcetera. But uh, to the human ear, it may not be very perceptible. Okay. <coughs> For example, I am talking even if there is a momentary glitch, you would more or less make out uh, what I am talking about alright. So, that is why in that sense it is very inherently fault tolerant. So, that is unacknowledgement, unacknowledged connectionless service that is one kind of service. Acknowledged connectionless service, this is another kind of service. So, each frame is acknowledged by the receiver. Uh, so, this is uh, suited for unreliable channel where uh, so we require this acknowledgement for special reliability. Acknowledged connection oriented service ensures that all frames are received and each is received exactly once and these services are accomplished using as I said simplex not usual, but half duplex or full duplex channel. So, this is some examples not very important uh, sorry. So, it is a reliable message stream, uh, it, it may be connection oriented service or it may be connection less service, uh, it may be a, a reliable message stream or reliable byte stream. So, reliable message stream sequence of pages, reliable, reliable byte stream let us say remote login. So, they are coming byte by byte, here it is coming page by page. Unreliable connection like digital voice, unreliable datagram. So, these are, but the, when you come to datagram, this becomes connection less service, unreliable datagram, acknowledge datagram, request reply etcetera. Now, uh, let us uh, look at uh, just uh, one thing that where does this all this data link layer ex exactly where does it exist. Physical medium we understand it is a cable or it is this uh, electromagnetic field, this free space. Uh, etcetera or a fiber. Uh, so, we can see it, we can feel it, but where does the data link layer reside so to say. Okay. Now, frames could be fixed length like ATM alright. Mm, so, ATM cells are a fixed length. So, you know once you have synchronized, you know that um, uh, they are going to come with uh, in a 53 byte kind of uh, uh, regularity, but uh, frames could be variable length also in which case we use this byte count, uh, byte stuffing, bit stuffing, generic framing procedure, Manchester encoding etcetera. Thank you.